Welcome to Question Mark, the podcast, exploring the greatest story ever told with open minds and open hearts. We light it up, we won't come down, and the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show, where it's covered in all the colored lights, and the runaways are running the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. This is the greatest show. Hello, and welcome to Question Mark, a fortnightly podcast about Mark's gospel, the greatest story ever told. We're very pleased to have you with us today, whether you visited us before or whether it's your first time. My name is David Payne, and I'll be your host for this. It's the 46th episode, believe it or not, in our journey through Mark's gospel. Slightly different today, though, as you will see. Steph has invited back some guests to meet Dr. Rowan Williams, and I will introduce them now. Firstly, this may not be the order up there on your screen, uh, Steve Nichols. Would you like to hold your hand up, Steve, for the YouTube YouTube people? Thank you. Long-standing friend of Steph, who has been travelling on some of Steph's re- recent performances of Iron Mark. Um, driving, I can imagine. Steph was, Steve, brother was one of the first guests on episode four back in July 2021. Not the first, that is to, yet to come. Then we have Dan Angus, a former student in Steph's English class and now a good friend of his. Over the years, Dan, his wife and Sarah and Steph have had many wonderful conversations about Mark's gospel. And it was these conversations that were the inspiration behind this podcast. And Dan and Sarah were, in fact, our first ever guests. So that's quite a position. Congratulations on that. Then more recently, much more recently, John Burnett joined us in episode 24, I believe. And he will be back with us soon, I believe, too. He also had a great discussion in a yet to be published episode with Shane Claiborne. So watch out for that. He runs the Gospel of Mark workshop and has devoted much of his life to Mark's gospel. We're very happy to have you with us and all of you, in fact. But our special guest today is Dr. Rowan Williams, who has many titles, many accomplishments, is a Welsh Anglican bishop, theologian and poet. He's a prolific author, having written, among many other works, a book of Lent talks called Meeting God in Mark. So I'm hopeful that we'll have a great conversation today. He's probably best known as being the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury, a position he held for 10 years until December 2012, which was, of course, a decade ago this month. Um, So a decade later, Dr Williams, you are still a frequent visitor to our newspapers and TV screens, I wonder what you actually spend most of your time doing these days. You probably don't want to be called a former archbishop all the time. I sometimes say I'd like to be called a recovering archbishop. (laughs) (laughs) What I spend most of my time doing is is probably answering emails, but um, that's not a very good answer for this. I'm active in the local parishes, help a bit here in Cardiff, where we're now living. Um, I'm working with the government of Wales a bit on a project on the future of local democracy here. I'm still doing a little bit of teaching for Cambridge and other places and St. Melitus College in London. And um, yes, reading a bit, writing a bit and praying a bit and trying to keep warm this winter. (laughs) Yes, indeed. And appearing on the occasional podcast when requested. Appearing on the occasional podcast. We're very, very grateful. Well, gentlemen, I'm sorry we haven't got any ladies with us. There are uh, quite a few ladies who... uh, um, been on the podcast but uh, they didn't submit any questions which is actually how some of you got in anyway but uh, the questions will come later today's passage is entitled jesus curses a fig tree and clears the temple courts and uh, in our last episode with rico tice we were left with a cliffhanger of jesus having been welcomed into jerusalem by crowds shouting hosanna then arriving at the temple courts because it was already late he went out to bethany with the 12 disciples Seems like quite an anticlimax to me, but let's listen to Lucy Warner reading the passage and find out what happened the next day. Mark chapter 11, verses 12 to 25, New International Version. Jesus curses a fig tree and clears the temple courts. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? 
The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him, because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, Go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Okay, so as I say, uh, today's recording is slightly different, very different to normal, actually. I'm going to ask uh, Rowan Williams to talk about the passage as he sees it for 15 or 20 minutes. And then there'll be an opportunity for our other guests to ask some questions and discuss the passage together. So, so Rowan, would you like to share your thoughts on um, the fig tree and Jesus in the temple courts, please? This is a notoriously difficult passage in St Mark's Gospel. Many people have presented it as showing Jesus in a rather negative light. Isn't he being a bit petulant? He goes to look for figs on a fig tree when it isn't the season for figs, and then he blazes out, it seems, in anger at the fig tree and curses it, even though there was no chance in the first place of his finding any fruit there. Is Jesus actually that sort of person? Or is there something a bit more complicated going on? Well, lots of commentators have pointed out that the story of the cursing of the fig tree is here one which frames a much better known story and a much more straightforward story, which is Mark's narration of the cleansing of the temple in Jerusalem. And we can scroll back a little bit to the end of the preceding episode after the entrance into Jerusalem. Jesus goes into Jerusalem, goes into the temple, and when he had looked round at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany. Jesus looks around at the temple. On the following day, he looks at, he inspects the fig tree. It's almost as if he's staging for the disciples something that's going on in his own action, in his own mind. He's looking around for signs of life. And where the fig tree is concerned, he's not finding them. And so when he goes back into the temple, once again, having looked around in the temple for signs of life, what he finds are the signs of a kind of life that doesn't have very much to do with what the temple is for. He finds the signs of an anxious, busy, and rather corrupt religious obsessiveness. People buying and selling, people feeding their resources and their energy into the sacrificial system, which at the time is manipulated by the priesthood in Jerusalem for their own profit. He cleanses the temple. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He opens the way for another kind of life in the temple, you might say. And sure enough, on the way back from this dramatic action, passing the fig tree, he's able to say, well, that kind of life which is obsessive, anxious, fearful of God, that's withered up. Something else is about to happen. So that's one way into understanding the story. It's about different kinds of life, the signs of life that Jesus looks for and doesn't find, the signs of a rather distorted kind of life in the temple, the promise of something new coming. And just as a matter of clarification there, it really isn't a matter of Jesus saying that Judaism or the Jewish religion has dried up or died or withered. He's much more clearly saying the way in which the temple is administering its system at the moment is not what Judaism is for. It's not what God's will for the Jewish people is all about. And he's able to quote Jewish scripture to underline that point. So let's not think of this as a kind of attack on the Jewish identity, which Jesus shares with all those around him. But having said that, there's a little bit more going on as well. And this perhaps takes us a stage deeper. 
it's not the season for figs. What's the point of putting that little detail in? For one thing, of course, Jesus is a Galilean countryman. He knows what the season for figs is, and it's not very likely that he would forget on his way to Jerusalem that this is not the season for figs. It's not as if he's uh, reasonably expecting there to be figs on the fig tree and they're not there. He knows perfectly well what time of year it is. It's almost as if he's saying, what I'm looking for is a kind of life that breaks through the ordinary cycles of the succession of human ages and human activity. What I'm looking for is the kind of life that belongs to and with God's future. What I'm looking for and what I'm about is the presence of that divine future here and now. The fact that it's not the season of, for figs is, you might say, no excuse. Mm. What the identity and the faithfulness of God's people is all about, in and out of the temple, is the possibility of God's future being apprehended as active and transforming here and now. And the trouble with the temple system is that it's not open to God's future. It's all about, as I said earlier, an anxious, almost obsessive activity, trying to impress God, trying to buy God's favour, trying to trade your way into God's favour. And as such, it's very readily corrupted and exploited by the governing elite in Jerusalem. And the last thing you expect to see there is the freedom, the glory, the dignity of God's future in the middle of human life. So one of the things I hear in this admittedly difficult and complicated text is, as it were, Jesus reminding us that what he's been saying and doing all the way through Mark's gospel is something to do with God's future being present here and now. And I think the first hearers and first readers of the gospel would have been alert to that kind of echo, that kind of resonance in the story. They've heard that the kingdom is on the way, the kingdom is at the door, the kingdom is upon you, within reach, the kingdom is among you. That's part of what Jesus is saying and doing in his acts and words. And so something, if you like, has disrupted the ordinary processes of history. And God's future has been accelerated. It's racing towards us. And it's going to come to its culmination in the extraordinarily sort of rushed bustle of Mark's story of the trial and death of Jesus. That astonishing narrative in which one event piles on another, Jesus is hurried through to his execution. And the kingdom, in some important sense, the kingdom is truly present in that ultimate moment of reconciliation and of mercy. So I wonder whether that's really part of what's going on here. Of course, it's not the season for figs. But then that's part of the ordinary world of the succession of events and actions that we're used to. The good news is that God's action cuts into this, cuts across it. And instead of either waiting around passively for the future or trying hyperactively to control the future, our job is to keep our eyes and ears open for the future coming among us unexpectedly when God is present to heal, to challenge, and to forgive. The healings that Jesus performs, the miracles Jesus performs, and the mercy that Jesus offers are all of them in their different ways, signs of that divine future. God's activity set free in the world in a way which both fulfills human history and in an important way disrupts it, interrupts it to say, you don't have to wait around for God to act, and you certainly don't have to persuade God to act. God is already there, already acting. Just turn around and you'll see him. And I think that has something to do with the way in which this particular passage of Mark ends. 
because the connection there is not immediately obvious. I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it and you will. Well, is that just a matter of Jesus saying, if you pray very hard, you don't know what might happen? You know, if you pray for fig trees to be cursed, well, who knows, they may be. Pray hard enough and you can curse fig trees like me. That doesn't sound very much like a, a central gospel message somehow. But notice how it's phrased. Jesus immediately goes on to say, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. When you pray, God's future arrives. When you pray, God's future arrives. It sounds unlikely. It sounds the most ambitious way of talking about God and history that you can imagine. But somehow, when you pray, what happens is what God wants. If you give it room, it'll be there. And forgiveness is perhaps the most visible, the most difficult, but also the most obvious sign of God's merciful presence being here in the midst of history. When we turn to the story of Jesus's death and resurrection, as the evangelists tell it, as Mark tells it, that is certainly the story of God's mercy, God's creative forgiveness, breaking in to a history of guilt, resentment, and unfreedom. So perhaps this story does hang together a bit more than we might imagine. Let's just go over it once again. Jesus has looked around the temple and gone home. The following morning, he gives notice to his disciples that what he's looking for is signs of life. And where there are no signs of life, things wither up, dry up, and die. He goes into the temple, looks around again. Where are the signs of life? Well, they're not there. So he cleans out the clutter of the temple, as if to open it up to the promise of God's future. And then, walking back with the disciples, the lesson is underlined. Peter remembered and said to him, Master, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. And Jesus, as it were, says, well, of course, that's the point. That's the point. Where there are no signs of life, things dry up and die. That's what happens. You've seen how easily things can dry up and die at the very heart of God's own people, the life of God's own people, and the worship of God's own temple. You see how things can dry up and die. What you have to do is not to be hyper busy trying to persuade God to be nice to you. What you have to do is open up the space where that future of forgiveness and healing can actually come in and be real in you and for you. So, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you receive it. Believe that when you open your heart, God fills it. And that is how forgiveness becomes possible between us, because God's mercy has already been there all along, just waiting for the space to come in and be effective and make the difference it can make. So it's a story at the end of the day about signs of life. And it's worth remembering also that a great deal of Mark's gospel is addressed to a church which is struggling, as far as we can tell, with two sorts of problem. On the one hand, if the scholars are right about Mark, it's written for a community that's facing quite a lot of trouble, quite a bit of persecution and harassment in whatever context it finds itself, possibly in Rome or in Alexandria, one of the big cities with a hostile or indifferent population around, and very much a sense of being a despised and harassed minority. Mark's Gospel presents to us Jesus saying, in effect, don't panic. God's future is God's business. And if you feel you're not doing very well, and if you feel you're not making quite the difference you ought to be making as a community, 
or getting the kind of attention you think you deserve as a community, well, leave it to God. God is active whether you think you're successful or not. The second thing that Mark's Gospel is addressing is a much more a poignant and painful thing, really. It's often been said that Mark is extremely rude about Jesus' disciples. They are, on the whole, a set of incurable clothheads. They constantly ask the wrong questions, they seem to take the wrong decisions, and are very happy to hair off in the wrong direction. And Peter, the prince of the apostles, the chief of the apostles, is the worst offender in this. The Peter of St. Mark is somebody who constantly gets things wrong. And it's rather as if Mark wants to say to his church, don't be taken in by what looks impressive and what claims to be authoritative. Don't listen simply to external claims for authority. Listen for God. Listen for Jesus. And again, you can frame that within the cleansing of the temple. You have, you have a system with people in authority in charge of it. Is that authority being exercised in the way that Jewish scripture and Jewish faith demand? Well, no, it isn't. There are very good reasons for being extremely suspicious of the people who run the temple. So don't expect the people in charge to get everything right, is also part of the subtext here. Don't expect the people in charge to get everything right. Keep listening for the voice of God in Christ. Keep looking for the signs of life in Christ. And it all begins to loosen up a bit and become a little bit more adventurous, a bit more risky, a bit more genuinely transforming. I don't think for a moment that Mark is saying, forget about the apostles and Peter, forget about the good order of the church, because the apostles are, after all, chosen and sent by Jesus. And St. Matthew, building on St. Mark, can make quite a lot of that and quite a lot of the proper authority that resides with the friends of Jesus. But don't lose your critical faculties. Don't let the authority of those who are teaching and leading in the church block off your attention to the voice of God and the challenge and judgment of God. I think that's the theme that goes on right the way through Mark. And you hear just some echo of it in this story as well. So what would the first readers and listeners have heard? They'd have heard something about the presence of God's future, God's kingdom, here and now. They'd have heard the warnings about signs of life and the wrong kind of life, the, the busy, self-satisfied, and at the same time anxious and fearful kind of life that bad religion can deliver. They would have heard something about the vulnerability, the fallibility of the systems of human authority in the life of faith. They would have heard a call to keep praying faithfully and openly, and to let that faithful openness to God's future show itself in a common life in which mercy, forgiveness, the restoration of relationship was at the very heart of everything because it's that which is the ultimate sign of life, that which is the real fruit of the Spirit in our midst. They're hearing this story as it leads into the story of Good Friday and of Easter. They're hearing it as part of the ground-clearing exercise that St. Mark is undertaking as we move forward into the great climax of his story. They're hearing it already as the proclamation of God's restoring mercy, God's anarchic, chaotic mercy, overturning all of our refusals of it, all our systems, all our expectations. And so I think they would have listened to the story with some apprehension, some sense of being called to account, but above all, with an enormous sense of gratitude for the presence of God's future and hope that it would come alive in them day by day. Thank you so much, Rowan. That was that was extraordinary. That was really, really interesting. I love the idea of Jesus looking for signs of life and um, wanting a life that breaks through the usual cycles of life. Um, 
Anyway, I'm not asking the questions. Who would like to go first with some question, with a question? I can have one each. I'll go first. Uh, Rowan, um, you've, you mentioned uh, verse 24. Uh, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. So what does that mean if the prayers are not answered? Is, is it, as the passage suggests, solely due to the lack of belief by the person who prayed? Or is there another explanation? Difficult question, isn't it? But it's one that many people ask constantly. And I think that the worst kind of answer we can ever give is to say, well, you know, you're not getting what you want because you're not trying hard enough. Whereas the whole message of the gospel is that it's not about trying hard enough. It's about God, God trying to get through to us. Yes, so yes. not a matter of blame. So I feel we have we have to use this language with, with care and sensitivity and try and hear in what Jesus is saying there something like this. When you pray, finally, what you're asking for is God to be more deeply real to you. And if your prayer is, is sincere and consistent, well, God will be real for you because that's what God always wants to be and to do for you and in you. How that relates to any specific prayer you make, we don't have any guarantees. What we know is that, to use a phrase used by a very saintly Welsh bishop a couple of decades ago, when we pray, God always gives us himself, said this bishop. Mm. And I think that's perhaps what puts that in perspective for us. Thank you. I'll answer your question, Steve. Great. It does, yes. yes. I, uh, yeah, the first phrase, it's a difficult question. Um, it, it, would, <laughs> would, would, I, it wasn't intended to catch you out. I just appreciate it is a oh, difficult question. It is a difficult question. Yeah. I think you've heard it before, haven't you? Dan, have you got a question? I believe, I think I saw a question of yours. Then. You, you did. You did. Um, thank you. Um, uh, and Rowan, thank you very much indeed for, for taking the question and, and for being here today. It's a, a great privilege. Um, I, my, my question, I think, loosely relates to, to the passage, uh, particularly uh, Jesus overturning the tables and driving out moneylenders um, and, and, and saying, my house shall be a house of prayer. So uh, if we think about today, uh, are, are we comfortable today in how our the institutions of our churches are being run. Uh, to, to expand a little, we see in the Church of England specifically and, and in other institutional uh, churches, the world of real estate holdings and hedge fund investments. Churches are filled with solid gold chattels and priests are wearing expensive robes. There are managerial organizations at work. And in some places you find people with ego uh, looking for power, who are in positions of leadership. I wonder if that is the world that we feel Jesus envisaged for his followers. It's pretty clear from the Gospels that that's not the world Jesus envisaged for his followers. What is that world? <clears throat> Fundamentally, it's a world in which every person knows that God is for them and with them, and that if they will let go of their own self-oriented and other damaging activities, God will be set free to transform them as God wants to transform them. That's the world Jesus wants to see. Everything else serves that. Everything else about the church as it develops has to serve that central vision of the new creation. And that's where we move forward to look at St. Paul and what he has to say about the new creation and the gifts of the Spirit. And that, of course, is where things historically get quite complicated, because people will say, all right, so what do we need in order to let that community um, establish itself and unfold and educate itself and defend itself and argue for its positions and so on and so on? And it's as if, oh, I don't know, every, every few centuries, people wake up and think, yes, hang on, we've been asking all those subsidiary questions about how, you know, how we keep the show on the road and how we defend what we've received and how we transmit it and what's needed for that. And we've forgotten actually what it's for. So every few centuries there's a kind of hang on a moment in the church's history where people kind of draw back and say, is this quite what, what we had in mind? And so you get the great return moments 
like St. Francis of Assisi going back and saying, well, you know, what we're actually for is perhaps a little bit more to do with kissing lepers than building basilicas or going on crusades. Or you have the great reformation in Europe, where people, again, are saying, um, is this all about preserving the, the dignity of a clerical elite, or is it about giving liberty and nurturing intelligence in the people of God at large? Time to think again. And people often say we're in the middle of something not dissimilar at the moment in the current church, where we're asking quite fundamental and critical questions. Now, I'm, I'm an Anglican. I don't want to immediately pull down cathedrals, um, have clergy in T-shirts, and <laughs> forget and abolish the church commissioners. You know, I don't think that's easily done, but we constantly need to go back to the question, so what for? What's the point of this? And what are we serving? What are our priorities? And those priorities are not even, and I would perhaps push back a little bit at some elements in the Church of England at the moment, they're not even about recruiting more people. They're really about that manifest willingness to be where God's heart is, with the forgotten, with the guilty, the poor, the excluded, and the despised. And to try and test the way the church works and the ritual and worship of the church in terms of how far it motivates us and enables us to go where God's heart is, that, that I think, is what we have to be asking. Thank you very, very much indeed for that answer. It's, it's very enlightening. Um, much appreciated. I think we'd quite like a, a snap answer that happens now, wouldn't we? And and your years of experience, mm -hmm. Rowan, clearly are clearly shown in that answer that you know you have to bring everyone together, and it takes time. Um, time. John, do you have a a question you'd like to ask or an observation? We waited. Yes. Weeks, you know. um, yes. Well, thank you for um, inviting me, and and thank you, um, Dr. Williams, for for coming to us. Um, I read this passage a little bit differently. And so uh, let me just sketch that out real briefly and ask you uh, for, for your comments. Um, it says when Jesus uh, condemned the fig tree, it says that the disciples heard him. And so I take that as meaning that they, they, they kind of got what he was doing. And, um, and that, if they got it, then they would be worried about that. And so when Peter, when they're walking towards the temple the next morning and Peter notices the fig tree is withered up, uh, his comment, uh, Rabbi, look, the, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. Uh, that sounds to me a little bit like he's pretty worried uh, because he, he understands what Jesus was saying uh, by by cursing the fig tree. Um, and so then Jesus' response is, uh, it's usually translated, have faith in God, but as you know as well as I do, that's not actually kind of what the Greek says. It, it It's a sort of an odd phrase. And I think it has to be translated, and nothing has to be changed at all in the Greek, but I think it has to be translated as, you have God's faithfulness which is a direct answer to Peter's worry. Mm. And, um, and so then he goes on to say, um, you know, if you, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea. Now, uh, there's where my question is. I, I read your little book on Mark the other day, and, uh, and one of the things that you keep coming back to there is that... Um, power as Jesus um, urges us to assume it uh, is not like power in this world. It's not the power that that destroys, but the power that gives life. And um, so I'm I'm just uh, kind of curious how you would uh, read that uh, can say to this mountain, which mountain is he talking about? I think it's the temple. Um, and 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 how you fit uh, that statement into your statement, uh, or vice versa, of, about um, how power in Christ is not 
the same as power in the world. Thank you. That's a difficult one. Um, let me think out loud for a moment. That's what we're hoping. <laughs> I must say, I, I've often taken this mountain just as a kind of any old mountain. You know, say, say this mountain um, without being specific. But I think you're right. It could be read and has been read sometimes as something to do with the mountain of the house of the Lord. Um, and there is, therefore, in it certainly something about the impending sweeping away of that, that system represented by the mountain. And in that, it seems to me that Jesus's own manifest commitment to changing the world, not by violence, but by compassion, suffering, and sacrifice. I think that that's not so much um, a contradiction to what Jesus is saying as going back to where you started with the have faith in God and God's faithfulness. Trust that God keeps his promises. The history of God's interaction with his people in the history of Israel is actually one of frequent disruption and violent change and the re-establishment of the covenant after um, exodus and exile and all sorts of things like that. Well, trust that the God who has committed to you remains committed. So even if this mountain is taken up and cast into the sea because of the new level of prayer and faithfulness that's opened up in Jesus, it's the same God. God. It's God who remains committed to you. It's not that either you are like violently disrupting God's covenant with his people, not that God is breaking his promises, but something is carrying through even the deepest of disruptions. But as I say, I'm thinking out loud here. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering how to, how to digest that. I'll, I'll have to go and, and ponder that further, I think. It's uh, curious when Jesus, uh, as you say, cleanses the temple, and he, as you know, a lot of scholars would say rather he he shuts it down yeah. um, and stops the sacrificial system from working and so forth. Um, how would you compare uh, the the uh, sacrificial system of the temple to the sacramental system of the church, and and, and how might this relate to that? It's right at the heart of the sacrificial system of Israel is, of course, the idea of a sacrifice of thanksgiving. You are enabled to give God something because God has given you something. It goes sour and goes wrong when you think, I am giving God something so that God will give me something. And that's completely the wrong way around. And any sacrificial or sacramental system, mm -hmm. which starts from the idea, I give God something so God gives me something, has it upside down. So a sacramental system in the life of the church has to be one where you're constantly saying, what we can give God is simply what God has given us. And in the Greek Orthodox liturgy of Holy Communion, one of the climactic moments is when the priest says, thine own of thine own do we give thee. We give you what is already yours. It's, of course, it's a phrase from Hebrew scripture itself. We give you what you have given us. And supremely, in Holy Communion, we, in inverted commas, give God the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, remembering that and, as it were, laying it out before God and saying, this is what you've given us. And we give it back to you in thanksgiving. And we ask that through that remembering you feed us afresh with the life you've given. So the, the emphasis remains always on the initiative of God in that and the element of thanksgiving, which is why, of course, the word in my tradition, the word Eucharist for Holy Communion, thanksgiving, is so important. But I think that's, that's how I'd see both the continuities and the disruptions there. The sacrificial system begins with 
we give because you've given, not you must give because we've given. And that carries over, to my mind at least, into the sacramental theology of the church when it's doing its job. And one of the great controversies of the Reformation was exactly this, wasn't it? Yeah. Which way around is that? <laughs> Thank you so much, Ryan. Well, Steph, I think you're the, the one in the corner there. You should probably have a have a chance at, at, at asking a question. What would you like to ask? Thanks. Thanks, David. Yes, Rowan, thank you again for coming on the show. It's really great to see you. Thanks for that wonderful talk and indeed answering those questions earlier. Um, I hope my question is, is a helpful one. Um, I think for me, one of the key things that I don't get is what actually Jesus is up to in the temple. And I've read all sorts of stuff. And today I've heard another um, idea which you've given, which I think is, is, is as compelling as the rest of them. But I guess for many people, as they read the section where he's overturning the tables of the money changers, indeed, when, when I do that in performance and I throw my chair across the stage, it's quite kind of startling, isn't it, that he does that. Mm -hmm. And I think for many, as they read that, they think, I think as Dan suggested in his question, there's, a, there's an issue about money. There's an issue, mm -hmm. uh, I think you mentioned the word corruption. Uh, there's a mission about there's a, a, there's a sense of exploitation going on, perhaps. Is that what Jesus is annoyed about? And when I say the word annoyed, I have to use that word advisedly, because I think in other Gospels, he's perhaps referenced as angry. But here is necessarily um, any reference to anger. So, I mean, anyway, whatever the case, that's one possibility. But for me, as I've read this and kind of tried to Look, look at it more forensically, I guess, or just pay attention to everything, because I need to, as I say these words, I'm, I'm kind of struck by what Jesus actually says, as well as what he does. And when he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, interestingly, the for all nations bit, which is taken from scripture, isn't in the other synoptic gospels. Uh, and when he says, but you have made it a den of robbers, I'm just wondering, whether those are clues as to why he's doing it, why he's uh, disrupting things so kind of um, assertively. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm just trying to follow Mark's logic, and I really am attracted by this for all nations business. And I'm thinking, Mark has an, actually in the past got Jesus to focus specifically on the fact that God's promise of blessing is for all nations it's not just for the jewish nation but for gentiles too which the disciples themselves are having trouble getting their heads around and indeed perhaps even mark's audience may well have done at the time as well given what we know of the controversies in the church in the first century so i'm, I'm just wondering is is there anything in what i've said that's kind of rings a bell with you is there something or do you disagree what's what's your thought there's a lot thank you there's a lot that rings bells there um of course one of the things we know about the system was that if you if you were coming from outside jerusalem you had to change your money into the temple coinage when you arrived and that's obviously not something which is particularly welcoming to people coming from from a distance very definitely not to people who who aren't part of the jewish family mm. so in that some of what's going on there, the money changing side of it, is about, if you like, making yourself acceptable to go into the temple. Mm. It's as if Jesus is saying, this is not the kind of place where you need to, you know, to show your credentials at the door, because this is this is where God opens the door of his mercy yeah. to all. And it's interesting that according to a lot of scholars again, and a lot of the rabbinic evidence, the the temple was seen by a lot of Jews as a kind of symbol of the whole creation. The, the great bronze um, water container in the, the front court of the temple was seen as the, the sort of primordial sea over which the Spirit of God hovered. The, the veil before the sanctuary was seen as the way in which the whole created order in all its diversity was sort of between us and God. So there's, there's that sense that this is a symbol mm. of the whole world. Mm. And therefore that phrase about the house of prayer for all nations and all the very diverse prophetic material about how everyone will be drawn to the mountain of god 
surely that's part of what's going on here. Jesus is saying, you're making this less than it can be, less than it should be. Yes. You're shrinking the scope of God's purpose and God's God's work somehow. Could it, less... be, could it be that we're these people, whoever they are, he's, he's focusing on, are narrowing down mm. God's mercy and making it, it exclusive to one particular people group as opposed to the whole world? Is that is that what's going on? I, I think that's part of it. I, <clears throat> I think it's also um, turning the word of grace into a means of profit, means of yes. power and advantage. Yes. Um, there, there are people, and we again, we know from rabbinic sources that there was a lot of controversy about the involvement of the high priestly families in the business of the temple. That was where they earned a lot of their wealth. And um, they were regarded with a good deal of suspicion by by the Pharisees as well as by ordinary Jewish people because of that consolidation of wealth on the basis of the temple. And yes. you know, how, how on earth can you turn the business of worshiping and honoring God into a into a means of profit and security for yourself? I think that again is is the subtext there. Mm, interesting. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Very good, very really interesting. Has anybody else? We've got a bit of time. Has anybody else got any other questions they'd like to ask? But you know, there there was wasn't ever a time when uh, the temple was free of uh, or, or pure somehow from the business that the temple involved. I mean, you always had to buy animals, and you always had to pay your your temple tax, and you always had to change your coin into into pure coin engine and so on and so forth. So what was Jesus doing? I mean, I mean, you know, uh, chasing out the animals or, or, or what? I mean, you had to have animals for the sacrifice and God had set up all those sacrifices. So, so what was that about? I think there is a, a level at which you have to see Jesus as challenging something about the sacrificial system. And again, picking up on what you find in Jewish prophecy, um, the idea which is beginning to get some traction in a book like Malachi, which gets a lot of traction in um, the other literature of Second Temple Judaism outside the Bible, which is that what you're moving towards is is the bloodless sacrifice, the sacrifice of, of your will and your love and your devotion to God, that that's what sacrifice is really about. And that builds on such a lot in the prophetic tradition. So I think it may well be that Jesus is saying, you know, the time has now come when we've got to take this absolutely seriously, that the, the bloodless sacrifice is what is now demanded of us. And the system, as it's developed of animal sacrifice in the temple, is just not where Jewish integrity now lies, if Jesus is concerned to restore and deepen the integrity of the Jewish people as they're meant to be, then that's the point at which the point to which they've come or sh should be coming. I think you can hear something of that in the next chapter, can't you? Where the teacher of the law asks Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Mm. And Jesus tells him to love the Lord your God, etc., mm. and love your neighbor as yourself. Mm. And the teacher of the law responds, uh, that's better than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Exactly. exactly. And again, he's, he's quoting all sorts of texts you find in Hebrew scripture. Um, the Lord loves obedience more than sacrifice there in uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, uh, stuff in Hosea about mercy and not sacrifice and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a strand that is being pulled out systematically by Jesus in his teaching and his encounters, I think, at this stage. I have a slightly wider question. I'm going to ask a question. Um, so we have two main questions on this show. One is um, what what was meant to the original hearers, and the other is how do we apply it today? And I just wonder, as as we have you here with us, uh, Rowan, um, there's some very difficult things going on in the world at the moment. The church isn't particularly popular. Jesus doesn't seem to be flavour of the month. What would you say to us as 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 believers that we can? That's a very big question, perhaps, but that we can learn from Jesus, learn from his words generally. And um, if you were Archbishop of Canterbury, what would be your New Year's message, I suppose? 
<laughs> oh, it's a bit of a relief not to have to worry about that. <laughs> I, I guess that what I always want to come back to is that what what persuades people to listen to Jesus, to take Jesus seriously, is the seriousness and the joy with which we look to Jesus. Mm. Do we look grateful? Yeah. Do we look um, baffled, amazed, and delighted in the presence of Jesus? Yeah. Or do we just look worried? Mm. Or, worst of all, do we just look religious? <laughs> mm. Is there something about the presence of Jesus in our lives which which enhances and augments our, our humanity, the depth of our humanity? And the trouble is there isn't a, a simple formula for that. Yeah. We can point to lives here and there, which I think show it. We can certainly point to the sort of habits and situations where it becomes invisible. But no, it's it's not a formula. It's just that we can we can, I think, quite rightly say of this or that life, well, that's what I mean. That's somebody turning their face to the light of Jesus. Yeah. And it, you know, it floods their life it gives them purpose it gives them joy it gives them um it gives them godly fear if you like you know a sense of being mm. responsible but above all that sense of gratitude and i i've said all too often probably that it's gratitude that we have to begin begin and end with all the time and the question we have to ask just as i said earlier the question we must ask about our forms of church life is what do they serve so I'd say about a whole range of things in our church language and church life, are they somehow expressing real gratitude, a sense that we have been gifted with something? Mm. So, yeah, that's it's a rather general answer to a very sticky particular question. But, well, unless we can in some sense live out a human life which looks as though it's been enhanced by the presence of Jesus, why should anyone be interested? Mm. They won't be interested because we exert lots of social power. They won't be interested because we we have lots of flawless answers to complicated moral questions. They will perhaps be, in some sense, drawn in if it looks as though there is, well, there is pasture. There is something to eat, to be nourished by. Yes, lovely. Help you grow. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's why I'm involved in this podcast. I see. I'm beginning to see that in Mark's gospel, anyway. And I loved what you said at the, right at the beginning about Jesus, the idea of Jesus looking for signs of life in the church, and mm. Um, mm. and I guess enjoying it and endorsing it when he sees that. Does anyone have any questions? I mean, that was a, a fantastic way to end, but um, we, there is space if you want it. Well, well just just add a little bit, yes. a little bit to that conversation um, around, uh, you know, what what do we learn from from our reading, uh, and how do we apply it in our lives today? Um, and I, I I would like to take this opportunity actually to commend Rowan uh, for being quite a reforming character uh, in the church for being someone who did more than anybody else, I think, for promoting inclusivity uh, and for reaching out to as many people as possible. Yeah. Um, and so to, to expand on your question, David, and or to give a comment, you know, as, as, we, as we look to Jesus, we learn from Jesus, we have a relationship with Jesus, so that informs how we look to and learn from and relate to those of, uh, around us. Uh, those who are believers, who aren't believers, um, and always love the the the, the deep kind of uh, ethical, moral, and and theological discussions that, that I tend to take part in. But at the centre of it all, I think you know, without being too trite, I hope Jesus preached love, uh, and and if we are able to learn from that, you know, uh, my house is a, a house of prayer for all nations. We can we can look at that today and say, well, actually, you know, this is a house of prayer for gay people. This is a house of prayer where women have some say and some agency. This is a house of prayer for everybody. This is, you know, um, and that's that's about loving 
everybody around us and i think that's that's how we can be mm. more and more attractive to more and more people is to just show that love i think that what what we see in the gospels generally and certainly in mark is it's as if jesus holds out his hand looks you in the eye and says god longs for your company do you trust me when i tell you that if you do take my hand and you know, that's that's the good news. That's that's where it starts. Now, if we say yes to that, it will challenge us. It will change us in any number of ways. It will move us on. It'll baffle us sometimes. It'll disappoint some of our expectations. It'll enlarge others. But that's what he's saying. What I'm here to tell you, says the Lord, is God is eager for your company. That's why he made you. And he loves you so much that he's never going to give up on the hope of <laughs> having your company forever. And when Jesus invites people to have faith, he's saying, trust that, and trust me when I tell you that. And very often that's the kind of challenge he gives to people. Do you trust me when I tell you that? And it's as if when we come to the, the, the great traumatic ending of Mark, um, the bafflement of the resurrection moment, when all the, the women look into the tomb and see is... is emptiness. It's as if Mark says, now then, remember what he was saying all the way through? Do you still trust him? Mm. Do you still trust him? So good. Thank you ever so much. Thank you, Rowan. That was absolutely amazing. Um, Thank you all. Rowan and Stefan, Dan, John and Steve, uh, thank you so much for taking your time to share your thoughts with us. It's been a very special time. I've really enjoyed it and I've got lots to think about. We've enjoyed having you with us too, dear listener. And we hope you'll check out the website, im-mark.com and the Facebook community. That's all we have time for today. So until next time, goodbye from us all. Goodbye. If you enjoyed this episode of Question Mark and don't want to miss any future episodes, be sure to click on the subscribe button. This also means other people can find the podcast and join the conversation too. We'd also love if you could leave a review so we know what was good and what we can improve for future episodes. If you want to find out more about I Am Mark, Stefan Smart's solo word-for-word dramatisation of Mark's Gospel, go to www.sleek.bio slash Mark, where you can sign up for free for his newsletter and a whole host of other goodies. Join us and our special guests next time, where we'll continue to explore the greatest story ever told together. If you want to get involved with the podcast or have any questions or comments in the meantime, please do get in touch using the I Am Mark social media channels. We'd love to hear from you. We light it up, we won't come down. And the sun can't stop us now. Watching it come true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show where it's covered in all the colored lights. And the runaways are on in the night. Impossible comes true, it's taking over you. And this is the greatest show.